Um, I'm with Cardinal Vincent Nichols at Westminster. Um, Cardinal Nichols, thank you very much for joining us and, and launching this second series of the COVID-19 Chronicles. I wonder if you could reflect on the impact of this uh, coronavirus uh, on religion and belief, and particularly from a Roman Catholic perspective. Well, I think its impact is indiscriminate. So the impact of the pandemic cuts right across every aspect of society and inevitably hits the poorest the hardest. Um, from, the, from the point of view of the Catholic Church around the world, uh, it's obviously impacted and continues to do so on the outward observance of our faith in those things that we do when we come together as with every faith. And in a, in a funny sort of way, it's also helped to strengthen the more domestic understanding of the church. And something that, uh, for example, the chief rabbi has spoken very eloquently about, the strength of an understanding that the home is a holy place, a place of God. Now, I was brought up like that. And so we're probably finding a new balance between uh, the church as lived and experienced in the home and the, the liturgies and the great ceremonies of the church, which take place in community. Now, some of that has been illustrated, as you mentioned earlier, by that rather remarkable moment of prayer that Pope Francis held in a deserted St. Peter's Square in the rain. Uh, beautifully photographed, as only the Italians can do, I think, but immensely touching in the symbolism of here is this person who acts as the gathering point, the point of authenticity for the whole Catholic community around the world, uh, seen in isolation, and yet, yet not alone, millions and millions of people were watching that. So we have this great paradox and we're seeing it a bit more clearly of religion as a thing deeply in the heart, deeply in the innermost part of the human person. Uh, and that's growing because we've been pushed back into ourselves through social isolation. And yet also we can see how much it wants to flower. I walk outside the street here every day. There are fresh flowers placed at the closed doors of Westminster Cathedral. They're an act of love, just as a church building is an act of love. And we always try to do our best, give our best to God in the building. But people love their churches and long to go back, to bring together that deeply personal aspect of faith and its public expression. And in a funny sort of way, the poorer the people are, the more they feel this. So there's a sense of yearning for the church to open its doors again. There's also a sense of that isolation. It, it, it's making us aware of our vulnerability, isn't it? it it's, it's that connection with something that we're totally unused to. We're not used to being vulnerable. We're not used to being threatened by death in this way, at least in the West. Is there something going on there that's making so many people log in and take an, an interest who would not attend mass, who are probably not even Catholic, who may not even be Christian? So it, it's, it's really touching a button. What, what, what would you say that button is? Well, you know, I think Pope Francis talked about that on, on that evening, on that wet evening in the empty square. I, I seem to remember talking, him talking about vulnerability and suddenly finding ourselves in the same boat, as he put it. So we can no longer afford to be rowing against each other. We have to find ways of vigorously pulling together. Nobody is outside of this. And, and I think that search for expressions of solidarity we've seen right across this society and I'm sure many other societies. And, and we, we're learning, I think, that that solidarity springs and is nurtured in a belief in a, a greater purpose in our lives, in a greater unity between us as a human family, in the reality of God who is the giver of life and who will draw us to its fulfillment. So, you know, if you think of a barren landscape uh, in which miraculously, a limestone landscape, in which somewhat miraculously flowers bloom, then you know there's a deep down underground stream from which they're drawing water. And every now and then on a limestone landscape, that stream bursts out and there's a wonderful waterfall and then it disappears again. We're in one of those moments when we suddenly see the goodness 
and we search for its source. And its source, I do believe, is in belief in God, in belief in life as a gift, a gift that is shared, a gift that is given that we may be of service to each other, and a gift which is ultimately purposeful. Okay, I, I hear that, and that's a wonderful image that you've, you've drawn and very powerful words, but how do we ensure it continues? Well, it's, um, it's quite difficult to put in very simple phrases. If I had time, I, I would expound, I think, some of the principles of Catholic social teaching, which over a hundred years have been developed in order to lay some principles and directives for a more constructive uh, way of shared living and enterprise and business and all the rest of it. But I think, put it very briefly, and maybe as an opener for people in this, um, in this chronicle, it would be to say we have to be very careful about reverting to all the familiar categories of us and them. If anything, we've learned our commonality. And the worst thing that can happen is a quick revert to oppositional ways of life. And I would say that first to politicians. And we can already see hints that the issues around this crisis will quickly be made into party political issues to gain some advantage over an opposition. Now, oppositional politics is fine as a method, but not as a spirit. And, and we have to find ways both in politics and business and in our community lives of shying away from, resisting the temptation to separate into us and them and finding and holding to the common ground that we've experienced, that we've sensed, and that we now must build on. And what might that be, Cardinal Nichols? In other words, again, what tangible, what specific might, what, what might illustrate that as an actual example that people listening to this can go away with and think, oh, I'm gonna do that now. Okay, well, there's a concept at the heart of Catholic social teaching, which is of the common good. Now, people think about that as the best we can do for the majority. That's not the meaning of the common good. The common good is an aim in a society, as an aim in a family, as an aim in a local community, as an aim in a school, it means that nobody is excluded. So in order to understand the common good, we have to look at it from the very edge of a society. Pope Francis is fond of talking about the peripheries it's from the peripheries that we see things most clearly. So for example, if we look at our economic system from the point of view of somebody who is unemployed, then we begin to see a different challenge than if we look at it from a boardroom where the maximization of profit might return as, as the key factor. So the common good demands a different perspectives on everyday things. If we're looking as a family and we've got difficult neighbors and we just want to shut them out and forget about them. Well, that's going to result in fractions and in fractiousness. And somehow we have to say, what does my family life look like from next door? And what does this look like from the edge looking in? That's a very practical thing that everybody can do. And as I say, it's at the heart of re-envisaging how we live together. Yes, and in a way, what you've described is almost a, a genuine dialogue to understand somebody else as, as yeah. you wish to be understood. It's, it's, it's a two-way yeah. process. Um, I hope you won't mind, but I had a conversation recently with the fairly newly appointed chairman of BP. And he said what he wanted more than else was dialogue. And I said, well, of course, many people in the uh, ecological movement uh, will see you as the enemy, will see you as the prince of darkness. And he said, I know, but I want to talk. I need to talk. It's bad business to depend for our energy on, on the traditional sources. We won't last as a business. I have to keep not only my business interests in mind, but align them with the best interests of, the, of our delicate, creative world. So he's saying, come on, can we talk, please? Can we look at these things together, not oppositionally? I'd like to move on to the communication, if you like, and something, of course, that's a, uh, uh, an attribute of the Roman Catholic Church is it's a global body. And I'm wondering whether this pandemic is actually 
um, having an impact on that communication, that connection that you have with one another, because everybody's isolated right now. Uh, as you just said yourself, you're there at Westminster, um, at, as far away uh, as, as somebody just down the road in, in, in Westminster Abbey, it, it could be in Australia. So there's this, this distancing that we all have, there's a sort of equalization of, of, it, of it all. And I'm just wondering from the church's perspective, whether that's going to have an impact on, on relationships, on communication, um, which will continue after, uh, after we turn, return to some kind of normality, whatever that might be? Well, I, I do think it will. I had a number of these Zoom meetings yesterday. One was with colleagues who share the presidency of the European Council of Bishops Conferences. Now, normally we travel. Last time it was two days in, uh, I better not say, Bratislava. And it was freezing cold. And we got through our work, but it was not a particularly happy time. We did it in two and a half hours yesterday by Zoom. And I think it was satisfactory because we know each other. And similarly, yesterday, I had a conversation, or the day before, between the Chief Rabbi, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and myself. And it was a wonderful conversation. Now, we know each other, but these technologies give us a chance of far quicker, more fluid, and more responsive communications with each other, as well as saving a lot of time and energy. So I think we're all determined that these advantages will become part of our everyday of life. One final question, Cardinal Nichols, uh, which is to bring it to the local, so from the global to the local. Um, and when the church doors do open, which um, won't be too long, I'm sure, they won't be able to fill up in a way that they might have done. Um, numbers no. are to be limited. Um, and therefore the practice is going to continue to be effective. Even the, the, the mass itself and communion is bound to be uh, impacted. How, how do you envisage it beginning at the local level when your doors are open again? Well, we're in conversation with the government in, in these days this afternoon as well, actually. And, and what I would like to see is the, the, the first opening of churches, what we call individual prayer. And that is not a summons, not a timetable, not a communal practice, but just access so that people can go in, sit down, feel safe, begin to pray individually, individual prayer. That'll give us a chance to test some of the things we have to put in place, like social dis distancing, particular hygiene routines, supervision through stewards, and all of that in the very first stages. And as we build that confidence, I think then hopefully we'll be able to move to public events, public worship. Numbers will be limited. How we match those who want to go with the spaces that we have, uh, there are two or three very imaginative schemes at, at, at large at the moment, at least around here. Uh, one of the big London churches that has a big community of priests saying, We'll celebrate Mass 10 times on a Sunday, and we can fit all our parishioners in that 10 times, and we'll go through Ticketmaster, and they can book their places. At the so, I mean, it makes me smile. Others say, you know, our church is often full three times on a Sunday. Um, we can't duplicate Mass 10 times. So maybe we'll give people, according to the alphabet of the, the first letter of their name, we'll give them a Sunday a month. So for many people to begin with, they'll be coming to Mass once a month. And then we'll continue the streaming of the celebration of Mass as well. So it's going to be gradual because above all, we have to do this safely. We have to do this safely and we have to be guided by the science and we have to be, as it were, reassuring people. Because I think many people at the moment live with a lot of fear and we have to reassure people that the church is not just a place that they might want to go to, but it's also a place that it's safe to come to, and then their desires and replace their fears. Cardinal Vincent Nichols, thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you.